For years, the United States wielded semiconductor restrictions like a geopolitical weapon, aiming squarely at China's technological backbone. The strategy was straightforward, cut off access to cutting-edge computing hardware, and you effectively limit a nation's capacity to advance in artificial intelligence, quantum research, and military simulation. What Washington didn't anticipate was how this pressure would accelerate the very independence it sought to prevent. The story of how America's chip export ban transformed from leverage into liability begins with a fundamental miscalculation about resilience, adaptation, and the economics of technological self-reliance. The campaign to restrict China's semiconductor capabilities didn't emerge overnight. It unfolded systematically, beginning in 2018 when the United States imposed sweeping prohibitions on exporting sophisticated lithography systems and critical fabrication machinery to Chinese facilities. Extreme ultraviolet lithography equipment, the kind essential for producing chips at 7 nanometers and smaller, became completely off-limits. Advanced etching tools, chemical vapor deposition systems, and ion implantation machines faced similar constraints. Without these instruments, manufacturing cutting-edge semiconductors at scale becomes nearly impossible. But the restrictions went beyond hardware. Washington also barred American engineers and technical specialists from providing maintenance, calibration, or consultation services to Chinese chipmakers. Engineers employed at firms like Semiconductor Manufacturing International Corporation and Yangtze Memory Technologies found themselves compelled to resign or evacuate, leaving critical production lines vulnerable. This wasn't a unilateral American operation. The United States coordinated with key allies to construct what became an increasingly comprehensive blockade. The Netherlands controlled access to lithography through ASML. Japan regulated exports of critical manufacturing components and raw materials. South Korea's Samsung was enlisted to limit foundry services. In design software, specifically electronic design automation tools that are indispensable for creating modern processors, American companies maintained total dominance and enforced strict licensing barriers. By late 2022, the pressure reached a new intensity. On October 7th of that year, the Commerce Department unveiled updated export control regulations that fundamentally altered the landscape. The new rules didn't just target specific Chinese companies anymore. They established performance thresholds. Any processor meeting certain computational benchmarks was automatically banned from sale to Chinese entities, regardless of manufacturer or intended application. NVIDIA's A, 100H100 accelerators, along with AMD's MI250, were explicitly prohibited. These weren't niche products. They represented the industry's most powerful tools for training large language models, conducting scientific simulations, and powering data center operations. For NVIDIA specifically, the implications were severe. China had represented between one-fifth and one-quarter of the company's data center revenue. CEO Jensen Huang acknowledged that NVIDIA once commanded approximately 95% of China's high-performance computing market. After the restrictions took effect, that figure collapsed to zero. Conservative estimates suggest NVIDIA forfeited roughly $8 billion in potential sales within a single quarter from just one affected product line. Multiply that across multiple quarters and product categories, and the financial damage becomes staggering. Then, in December 2024, came the surprise. President Donald Trump announced via social media that NVIDIA would be authorized to resume exports of H200 chips to China. The semiconductor industry reacted with cautious optimism. NVIDIA issued a measured statement calling the decision a positive step for approved commercial customers. But Jensen Huang's response was notably restrained and for good reason. The devil resided in the conditions attached to this apparent concession. First, Sales would be restricted exclusively to pre-approved commercial buyers vetted by the U.S. government. Military organizations, state research laboratories, and government agencies remained off-limits. Every transaction would require individual authorization, and Washington reserved the authority to revoke permission without prior notice. A comprehensive oversight framework would monitor end-use compliance, including audits, usage declarations, and ongoing verification that chips weren't being diverted toward military applications or re-exported to unauthorized parties. Second, and this is where Trump's transactional approach became unmistakable, the U.S. government would claim approximately 25% of the revenue generated from these sales. Whether structured as tariffs, licensing fees, or special assessments, roughly one quarter of NVIDIA's earnings from Chinese H200 transactions would flow to the American Treasury. 
This represented a significant escalation from earlier arrangements, when NVIDIA had previously attempted to sell downgraded H20 variants to China, Washington had already extracted about 15%, now that figure had jumped to 25%, and the mechanism applied equally to AMD, Intel, and other American semiconductor manufacturers. For Trump, this approach aligned perfectly with his transactional worldview, converting a national security tool into a revenue generator. But for potential Chinese buyers, the arrangement looked less like a compromise and more like a carefully constructed trap. Why are Chinese buyers walking away? Well, let's consider the situation from Beijing's perspective. Any Chinese company purchasing H200 processors would be acquiring hardware that comes with permanent surveillance, unpredictable supply security, and honestly, a massive price premium. The monitoring provisions mean that how these chips get deployed remains subject to ongoing American scrutiny. And if US-China tensions escalate, as, you know, they frequently do, supply lines could be severed instantly. Usage restrictions might prevent deployment in certain AI training scenarios. In worst-case conditions, the chips themselves could become vectors for technical surveillance or remote limitations. For any serious enterprise, allowing critical computational infrastructure to remain under foreign governmental control represents an unacceptable strategic vulnerability. Core processing power must never become a choke point that adversaries can exploit. The cost structure just makes matters worse. That 25% revenue share isn't a standard import duty. It's a politically motivated surcharge targeting China specifically. H200 cards already command premium pricing, often exceeding tens of thousands of dollars per unit, adding a quarter again to that base cost, which Nvidia would inevitably pass along to customers, makes the economics increasingly unattractive. Ultimately, Chinese buyers would be paying substantially more for hardware that comes with usage restrictions, supply uncertainty, and potential monitoring capabilities. Under these circumstances, the H200 has effectively priced itself out of relevance in the Chinese market. But there's honestly an even more fundamental reason why demand for American chips is evaporating in China. Domestic alternatives have matured faster than Washington anticipated. The substitution effect, it's a classic concept in economic theory. When external supply gets disrupted, domestic industries often respond by filling the void. American sanctions have, maybe unintentionally, validated this principle within China's semiconductor ecosystem. Back in 2018, domestically produced equipment accounted for merely 12% of China's semiconductor manufacturing infrastructure. Six years later, by 2024, that proportion had surged to 40%, more than tripling in response to external pressure. What sanctions intended to constrain instead became a catalyst for accelerated indigenous development. The mechanism is, honestly, pretty straightforward. Before restrictions took effect, Chinese firms lacked compelling incentives to invest heavily in homegrown alternatives. Imported equipment worked reliably and met performance requirements. Once access to foreign technology was severed, companies faced a binary choice develop substitutes or exit the market entirely. Huawei really exemplifies this transformation. Over the past six years, the company has consistently allocated more than 20% of revenue toward research and development, translating to approximately $71 million in R&D spending every single day. This sustained investment has enabled Huawei to cultivate an extensive network of domestic suppliers spanning chip architecture, specialty materials, fabrication equipment, and advanced packaging. The American strategy sought to slow China's technological trajectory. The actual outcome has been to compress innovation cycles and force rapid indigenous capability building. Each escalation in restrictions has triggered coordinated industry-wide initiatives to overcome specific technological barriers. Huawei isn't alone in this effort. Numerous Chinese semiconductor companies have accelerated development programs and tangible results are emerging. Huawei's Ascend processor family and products from firms like Cambricon now deliver computational performance broadly comparable to the H200, often at significantly lower price points. This domestic alternative ecosystem doesn't just match American hardware on specifications, it also eliminates the strategic vulnerabilities associated with foreign dependence. Chinese companies deploying domestically produced accelerators don't face supply interruptions tied to geopolitical fluctuations, usage monitoring, or special revenue sharing arrangements. The geopolitical miscalculation here is pretty striking. Washington's semiconductor strategy rested on several assumptions that, frankly, 
haven't aged well. The first was that technological leadership would remain static, that American and allied firms would maintain insurmountable advantages in chip design and manufacturing indefinitely. The second was that China lacked the industrial depth and coordination capacity to develop competitive alternatives within relevant timeframes. Both assumptions have proven flawed. China's response to semiconductor restrictions has been characterized by substantial state support, coordinated industrial policy, massive capital deployment, and strategic patience. While Chinese chips may not yet match the absolute cutting edge of American technology across every metric, they've achieved sufficient performance for the vast majority of commercial and research applications. The gap is closing, and it's closing quickly. More importantly, for many Chinese buyers, good enough domestic technology that offers supply security and sovereignty outweighs marginal performance advantages from foreign sources that come with political strings attached. The lifting of H-200 export restrictions framed as an American concession arrives at a moment when it may no longer matter. The conditions attached to these sales, the monitoring requirements, the revenue sharing, the supply uncertainty, ensure that Chinese customers have every incentive to continue developing and deploying domestic alternatives. What happens next is, well, NVIDIA finds itself in an uncomfortable position. The Chinese market, which once made up about a quarter of its data center business, has effectively closed off not because of explicit bans, but because, honestly, the terms of re-entry have made American products both commercially and strategically unattractive. Technically, the company can sell H-200 chips to China now, but it's really unclear if anyone will actually buy them in any meaningful volumes. For Chinese semiconductor firms, the pressure just keeps building. They're advancing rapidly, sure, but they're not yet fully independent. There are still critical gaps in areas like advanced lithography, specialty materials, and certain types of design software. Closing these gaps is going to take sustained investment and, of course, continued progress in fundamental research. For Washington, the policy challenge is only getting tougher. Restrictions that were originally meant to preserve American technological advantages have instead sped up the development of a parallel ecosystem that could, one day, compete with or even surpass Western capabilities in specific domains. The more comprehensive the blockade, the stronger the incentive for China to push for complete self-sufficiency. This whole semiconductor conflict really reveals a deeper tension in today's geopolitics. In an interconnected global economy, technological containment strategies often lead to unintended consequences. Markets adapt, supply chains reorganize, and the countries being targeted end up redirecting resources to overcome those constraints. There's a certain irony to how all of this has unfolded. The United States tried to use its dominance in semiconductor technology as leverage to constrain a geopolitical rival, but, honestly, leverage only works when the other party actually needs what you're offering. By making American chips more and more difficult, expensive, and risky to get, Washington inadvertently destroyed the very dependency it was hoping to exploit. China's semiconductor industry was basically forced to mature much faster than it otherwise would have. Companies that might have stayed reliant on American technology for another decade ended up compressing their development timelines. Engineers who might have focused on incremental improvements instead set their sights on fundamental breakthroughs, and capital that might have gone into other sectors was suddenly pouring into chip R&D and manufacturing capacity. The H-200 export approval, with its 25% revenue share and heavy monitoring provisions, really sums up the core problem with the current approach. It treats technology exports mainly as a revenue opportunity and a surveillance tool, rather than as a strategic way to maintain interdependence and influence. Chinese buyers, after years of supply disruption and political uncertainty, have learned a pretty harsh lesson. Critical technologies just can't be outsourced to potentially hostile powers. And, you know this realization isn't going to vanish even if restrictions get eased. The trust that's needed for deep technological integration has been damaged, maybe even beyond repair. The semiconductor story honestly illustrates a much broader dilemma facing global technology governance. As advanced computing becomes more and more central to economic competitiveness, national security, and military capability, every major power is going to try to control its own technological destiny. Export controls and restrictions, if anything, just speed up this fragmentation instead of stopping it. The big question now is whether the United States and China will keep moving toward technological decoupling, each building their own parallel, 
incompatible ecosystems, or if, somehow, some form of managed interdependence is still possible, the H-200 decision suggests that Washington is trying to have it both ways, keeping restrictions in place while selectively monetizing exports. It's a strategy that doesn't really satisfy anyone, neither the security hawks who want total decoupling, nor the industry advocates who want open markets. For NVIDIA and other American chip companies, the long-term outlook is, well, pretty troubling. China isn't just a huge existing market, it's also the world's fastest growing technology ecosystem. Being shut out of that market or only being able to participate under really tough conditions basically means giving up ground to competitors, both foreign and, increasingly, domestic Chinese firms. The H200 chips that China might now refuse are more than just a single product category. They really symbolize a fundamental shift in the global technology landscape, where American dominance can't just be assumed, where restrictions end up breeding alternatives, and where the tools of economic warfare often wound those who use them. In the end, the United States might actually achieve its stated goal of slowing China's access to the most advanced American semiconductor technology. But honestly, the cost of that success could be the rapid development of a Chinese semiconductor industry that eventually becomes a formidable global competitor, one that's not tied down by American supply chains or weighed down by geopolitical constraints, Jensen Huang's cautious response to the H-200 export approval really reflected this uncomfortable reality. While the door to the Chinese market has technically reopened, Chinese customers are more and more just walking past it, choosing domestic suppliers who offer not just comparable technology, but something that's even more valuable, technological sovereignty. The semiconductor wars were supposed to preserve American advantage. Instead, they may have planted the seeds of the very competition that could one day challenge it. 